Hi, everyone. Um, I'm losing my voice, which is perfect timing. So I'm really hoping I'm not going to start having a coughing fit in the middle, so please excuse me. I'm normally up here saying, can you see me, because I'm so short. So the lectern's good. It's just the voice today. Um, so um, good to see you all. Thank you for joining us today. So I'm Justine Wolfe. I'm the Director of Consulting at Inecto. Um, we uh, support our clients with all aspects of reward consultancy. I've dropped some brochures on the table, so have a look and you can see the kind of things that we do. Now, I've always been really fascinated by Greek mythology, having studied ancient history at school. So I'm going to start by giving a bit of context to my title today. So Pandora was given a box by the god Zeus and she was told to never open the box. But of course, the minute he was out of sight, she lifted the lid and out poured all the troubles of the world, never to be recaptured. So anything that looks ordinary, but might produce harmful or unpredictable events, is known as opening Pandora's box. And then, named after the goddess of um, universal remedy who could cure all diseases, we use the term panacea to describe a solution to solve any problem related to an issue. So we've got two contrasting goddesses at play here, one who represents the creation of problems we didn't expect, and one who can solve all our problems. However, there is another goddess that you maybe not heard of, the goddess Themis. So she was the goddess of divine law and order, and she upheld balance across the universe. And really, when we think about reward transparency, we need to have all three of these goddesses in mind. Because in one hand, whilst being more transparent can solve some problems, others will inevitably quickly materialise. So really, it's about creating the right balance. Sorry, my clicker's not working. Right. So let's think about what's driving the need for greater reward transparency right now. So we know that pay secrecy enables disparities in pay. And although some countries like Sweden and Norway have made individual income publicly available for a number of years, the rest of the world is only just starting to catch up in terms of being more open about sharing pay information. So in the UK, we obviously started to see changes with the updated Equality Act in 2010, where we saw things like um, restrictions on pay secrecy clauses being included. And then obviously we saw in 2017 the introduction of the gender pay reporting regs, aiming to highlight the differences in average pay between men and women. And then earlier this year, we saw the introduction of the EU Pay Transparency Directive, which I'll talk more about in a second. And then on the other side of the pond in the US, we've seen various states trying to encourage employers to be more open about sharing their salaries, the salary, sharing, salary, sharing salary data, it's a mouthful. Um, so in New York, for example, towards the end of the last year, they um, brought in the New York City Transparency Act, where employers basically in that vicinity have to share salary ranges uh, for jobs that they're posting. So, this trend of global cross-pollination of pay equity laws is one of the reasons that we're seeing companies take pay transparency more seriously, particularly if they're operating across multiple states or countries. Now, in the US, it all started in California, and actually the original act was um, in, aimed at enabling applicants for jobs to find out the salary ranges of the roles they were applying for. But originally, you could only actually find this out after you'd been through the first interview. And then since then, various states have enacted different legislation. So we've now got salary history bans in over 20 states. And it means that with other versions of the New York City Act in other states, we've got over 25% of workers across the US living in areas where their employers have to share information on salary ranges. And then, as I said, earlier this year, we saw the um, implement introduction of the EU Pay Transparency Directive. Now, it is aiming to bolster equal pay protection across member states in the EU. And it comes into force in 2026. And the way that it's actually going to be implemented might look slightly different depending on the, the states involved. However, it includes things like job applicants having the right to see information for the initial pay level of the roles that they're applying for, 
um, workers being entitled to request information from their employer about how their individual pay compares to average salaries at the same level. Employers are going to have to share descriptions of the criteria they're using to determine pay levels and career progression. And they're also eventually looking to reduce the thresholds for gender pay reporting down to 100 employees. And where you see pay gaps of more than 5%, companies are going to have to conduct pay assessments to understand why that's the case. So although the directive doesn't apply here following Brexit, it is still relevant for companies that have operations across Europe and want to retain that consistency. And if the past few years have been anything to go by, I think that trend of more transparency from a legislative perspective is definitely going to continue. But it's not just legislation, it's also social that's influencing this trend towards more transparency. So in a world where we're sharing more data, what started out as sharing salaries anonymously on Google spreadsheets within certain industries and sectors, we then saw the introduction of pay sharing sites like Glassdoor and Payscale. And they've now become the go-to places for pay insights where salary ranges are absent. But we're also seeing on TikTok, I don't know if anyone's seen Salary Transparency Street, they go around in the US asking people, what do you do and how much do you make? And basically, people have very little hesitation sharing their salary information, particularly women and those under 40. And this trend of being more open to share salary information was highlighted in a LinkedIn survey. So it showed that 34% of Gen Zs were happy to share their pay information with anybody that asked. But that contrasted with just 4% of boomers, so those who are in their late 50s and older. And likewise, 25% of boomers say they're not going to share their pay information with anybody, but that contrasts with just 4% of Gen Zs. So that's, that's quite a difference. And when we look at the views on whether pay transparency leads to better equality in pay, whilst 81% of Gen Zs think that candor is a really good thing, only 28% of boomers see an upside in being more forthright about pay, and 42% don't want to go there. So what does that mean for people who are entering our organisations and those people that are leading our organisations? Well, it means those at the top are going to have to start taking this seriously and fast because it has real ramifications for our ability to attract and retain talent. There was a study by Monster that showed pretty much all of their respondents felt that employers should be sharing salary ranges, but actually it was the 53% that said they wouldn't apply for a job if the salary range was absent that we need to be worrying about. Glassdoor also did a study, and I'm going to obviously caveat it because transparency is their thing, but there were some interesting points that I pulled out, and the one that for me was that Pay transparency, is the, pay transparency is the number one indicator of an employer's long-term potential, so how long someone might stay with you. And yet only 15% of people said they knew the salary ranges in their organisation, and over half felt that pay secrecy had limited their career options. So I wanted to ask a question now. Hopefully we'll get the slide up. Are you getting more pressure from your employees to be more transparent on pay. So your options are not at all, same level as before, more frequent requests, or consistent pressure. So I'll give you a second to respond, and then hopefully someone will share with me the results. <coughs> Have we got them? Frequent requests for information, 48%. Same level of interest as always, 32%. Okay. So more frequent requests so coming more in. more frequent requests. Oh. Are we? There we go. Oh, okay. Brilliant. Okay. Thank you. So if we're getting more frequent requests for information, what stops us sharing it? I think there's lots of different reasons for us to not be transparent about pay. But I think one of the key ones is we're, we're actually quite afraid 
because once we open Pandora's box, the avalanche of questions will follow, and we're not necessarily prepared to answer them. So if we take pay ranges, for example, the kind of questions we might get. Why am I here on the range? How do I get to the top? Why is Joe Bloggs paid more than me? Sorry, I'm really sorry that that's really hard to read. Apologies. Um, but that's not a reason to do nothing. As I've already shown, you risk losing talent. And with studies like this one from Vizia showing that 68% of employees would switch employer for greater transparency, even if the pay level was the same, you could be fighting a losing battle. Now, there is anecdotal evidence that it's not all bad. Being, sharing salaries can be a good thing. So I'm sure many of you will have heard of Buffer. They're a tech-based company in the US, and they famously share all of their salaries and their pay policy for making decisions around pay. And after sharing their salaries, they found an increase in the quality and the number of applicants that they get for their jobs. And they're said to have a 94% retention rate on their staff. And in the UK, publishers Hachette have been introducing various salary transparency measures over the last five years. And they're said to have a 25% reduction in their gender pay gap. And we all saw the fraud that happened in the BBC when they first published the salaries of their highest paid earners a few years ago. And it led to a lot of heartache and a number of equal pay claims. But five years on, a lot of that noise has died down. And as the chart shows, there is a steady decline in the difference between um, average pay between males and females in that time. Now, we know that gender pay gaps are mostly caused by distribution, so, but there is evidence to show being more transparent can have an impact on your gender pay gap. And whatever the challenges are, the train is only going in one direction. Attitudes and legislation across the world are changing, and companies are facing pressure for, to adapt their pay policies for whatever comes next. So that leaves many of us asking the question, how do I know the right level of pay transparency for my organisation? And really, what we've got to think about is this pay transparency spectrum varies, and where you land up on it very much depends on who you are as an organisation and what kind of culture you're trying to create. Now, from what I've seen, while most public sector organisations are sort of somewhere in the middle, they're at the point where you, they share their pay ranges and you can see incremental pay progression. Quite a lot of public sector employees are, some, are further on, the, uh, private sector employees are on the left. So employees might know what they get paid and they might know that you do pay benchmarking, but that's pretty much where it stops. They don't necessarily know what benchmarking you do if you do any at all, how you use it if you use it at all, and what that means for your future pay potential. So the next question is, how far do you think you'll realistically go in the next three years? So again, on Slido, if we look at the what, how, where, why, and woe, the differences are, in terms of where you're sharing your pay ranges, people understand how they work. When we get to why, we're talking more openly in terms of reward as a culture, we're training our managers. And when we get to woe, we're sharing everything. So if you can have a quick go on Slido and let me know where do you think you'll go in the next three years. I might get it coming up. Okay. Okay. Any joy? A. Excellent. That's good, because that's what I was expecting. A few. <laughs> um, I do think most businesses will stop at the why. Thank you. We can put the slides back. Um, not every company wants or needs to get to the woe. And I think fundamentally, when the slides come up, we all want answers to the questions that are going to be on the slide in a second. them. No. Yay. Brilliant. Thank you. Right. So I think we all want answers to these questions as individuals, not just as HR or award professionals, as individuals. These are the questions we want to have answers to. And interestingly, when we do 
questions in engagement surveys, we normally ask the question, I think reward is fair in my organisation, and yet it comes out as one of the most lowing scoring responses. And why is that? It's because we share so little information. So if we want to think, to, if we can get to a place where we can answer some or all of these questions, we've got to go on a bit of a journey. So we work with our clients on a four-step journey, and it might take some businesses years to get to the end, but the critical bit is that we start somewhere. And I think we worry about most of these reasons, but we don't necessarily understand the scale of risk that we're exposed to. We don't necessarily know why everyone's paid what they're paid, what it's going to cost to redress any pay discrepancies, and maybe we don't have any structures in place. But in order to uncover the truth, we've really got to understand the level of risk we're exposed to. So we have to start with our data, and we have to clean it. I'm really sorry, it's not very exciting. But you have to look at your job descriptions. Have you got them? Are they up to date? You have to look at the data on your systems and the job titles. Are the 20 project managers you've got on your system really different jobs or just messy titling, uh, messy titling conventions? Have you got levels in your organisation? Do you have a basis for internal comparison? Now, ideally, we have an analytical job evaluation framework, but if not, even having some levels that have generic descriptors to enable us to differentiate roles between levels is helpful. And having market data, is it relevant? Is it accurate? Is it up to date? Has it got a robust methodology that you can stand behind? And once you have all of these things, we can start to think about doing equal pay audits. And we can look at pay differences by, by level, by function, by, within the same role. And where we've got gaps of more than 5%, can we explain them? Now, I'm not saying we have to pay everyone the same. There's absolutely justifiable reasons on the basis of market or performance. But most organisations don't capture the evidence of why we've got pay differences. So you need to start to put your house in order and put plans in place to address issues where you've got them. Uh, click a stop. There we go. Oh. Yeah. And once we understand what the risks are, we can start to take control. Now, pay discrepancies often, often happen when our pay frameworks are out of date, then they're, they're ignored, or they're never properly explained. So taking control is about reinforcing your policies and your frameworks so you can explain them and you can stand behind them. And then if they're not working for you, then they need a review. So we think about our pay ranges. Many of us will have pay ranges. We'll have a start, we'll have a top. We might have a midpoint. But how do people get through those pay ranges? If your aspirational place is the midpoint, what happens when people get there? What about the top half of the range? How do we use it? Employers will see a range. They'll see a top, they'll see a bottom, and they will assume they can get to the top. So if they can't, you need to tell them. And we need to build confidence in our organisations. And one of the biggest challenges in adopting transparency is our managers have limited understanding. And yet they're the ones on the front line with all, getting all the questions. So there was a study by Harvard Business Review that showed that only 15% of managers have training to talk about, to their employees about pay. So if we want to be more transparent, we've got to train our managers to answer some of these tricky questions, because if we don't, it's just going to lead to more confusion. And we can involve them more in decision making. So we use our pay lab tool with our clients and it gives managers ownership of decisions because they can look and see through different lenses how pay compares to the market, to peers, using ethnicity, gender, performance. So you can make rounded decisions within your frameworks. And then when we feel more confident, we can start to explain how pay works, what that means for future pay potential. And we can share insights. So this is an example of a dashboard that we use with our clients. But the idea is that you demonstrate to your employees that you take pay fairness seriously. And that is ultimately good for employee satisfaction. So pay transparency doesn't have to be this. We are not all in the luxury of a startup. We are living with decisions that maybe we didn't make and we can't defend. But we can start to address the issues now before legislation, litigation, or social pressure makes us. And if we're going back to our Greek goddesses, let's put Pandora and Panacea to one side. It doesn't have to be catastrophic. 
and it's certainly not going to be perfect. But if we can channel our inner themis, wherever we land up on that transparency spectrum, it will feel right and it will hopefully balance everybody's wants and needs. So thank you. Um, just to say, um, if you scan the QR code, you'll be able to get copies of the slides and other information if you, if you want it. And we're outside on the, the stand, just on the left, outside the door. So please do come and speak to me. Thank you. <laughs>